Hello, everyone. I'm Cynthia Curry, Director of the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials, or AIM Center for short. Uh, before we begin the presentation, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to orient you to the Zoom interface. Uh, so, Luis, if you would advance the slide once. This webinar is being uh, live captioned, and to view the captions, you click on the closed caption button, which is in the upper right corner of your Zoom window. Uh, you should see a call out stating that closed caption is available. And we'd like to thank Donna, uh, who's our closed captionist today. You know, it's a, a lot of work uh, to do this. And you're, uh, we always rely on the expertise of our, of our captioners. So thank you for your service today. Upon activating those closed captions, uh, you'll see your captions appear along the bottom of the, Zoom, of the Zoom window. And of course, it wouldn't be an AIM Center webinar if you weren't encouraged to contribute to the conversation in the chat. If you don't see the chat panel, click on the chat button at the top, at the top of the Zoom window near the closed caption button. Uh, and when you enter text for the chat, make sure that all panelists and attendees appears in the to field. So at the bottom of the, the chat panel, uh, right above where you enter text, you'll see a to field. Uh, it may by default say all panelists. If it says all panelists, it means that your messages are only going to the panelists for this webinar. We want to make sure that uh, whatever you are contributing, your questions, comments are seen by everybody. So click on the drop down arrow and choose all panelists and attendees to make sure that everybody sees your comments. Uh, for those of you who are tweeting today, you can, can contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag aim numeral for all. Uh, so please, uh, please do that and spread the word about accessible presentations. And finally, if you want to advance the slide, Luis, a reminder that you can download materials for this webinar, including both the slide deck and a digital handout that Luis has prepared for you. It's on the event page on the AIM Center website. The URL is on the screen and Luis, uh, Leslie O'Callaghan, our AIM uh, Center Coordinator, Operations Coordinator, is uh, dropping those, those links in the chat as well. Finally, there's gonna be a recording of this webinar within a week. Um, and it's going to be at that, same, at that same URL. So just before moving on to Luis's accessible presentation, I'd like to formally welcome you to this webinar. Uh, as many of you know, the AIM Center and CETA have what we're promoting as an EdTech accessibility partnership. We're grateful for the opportunity to support you as, as you work toward making products more accessible uh, for, for your stakeholders. This is the third webinar that we've presented for CETA members. The first two were uh, accessible websites, which was presented in November by Lynn McCormack, our software engineer. And in December, uh, the topic was accessible documents that was presented uh, by Luis Perez, who was not an AIM Center uh, technical assistant specialist at the time, but we have nabbed him since. So uh, we're delighted that this presentation um, is being presented by an AIM Center TA specialist, uh, Luis Perez. So if you missed those, uh, those presentations, the original, uh, the first two webinars, I will drop the links uh, to the recordings in the chat during Luis's presentation. So Luis, take it away. All right, give me one second, everybody, while I find my cursor here and go to the next slide. All right, so um, Leslie, if you could, uh, if you could just go to the chat area and for every fifth person, that's watching the webinar. If you could just go ahead and turn off the sound for them. No, just kidding, Leslie. I don't want you to do that. I just wanted to make a quick point. So here's the, uh, the issue. Uh, when we look at the incidence of people with disabilities in the United States, that's one in every fifth person. And that's actually probably a conservative estimate because that's just the people that have reported that they have a disability. Uh, but there's probably a lot of other people that, you know, have not either been diagnosed or they don't want to disclose that they have a disability. Uh, so the number is probably a little bit larger than one in fifth. But even starting from a baseline of every fifth person having some kind of disability, either visible or invisible, imagine that you're having a meeting or imagine that you're having doing a presentation and every fifth person can't see the slides or can't hear the, what you're saying during your presentation. Imagine the impact that that would have on their ability to participate and then take out that information from that meeting 
and then have an impact um, and promote your message further than just that presentation. So that's really going to be the topic today is how do we make our presentations more accessible so that we allow everyone uh, to have equal participation in our meetings, in our presentations, and in our events. Uh, so as Cynthia mentioned, my name is Luis Perez. I'm uh, now a TA specialist for the National AIM Center. I'm really happy about that. Um, it's a great place to work and a great group of people that are really passionate about accessibility and inclusion. So it's a, it's a great fit for my passion for this topic as well. All right, so I have a question that I want to start with. What does a pitcher of water have to do with creating an accessible presentation? Go ahead and if you have any clues, any ideas, go ahead and post those in the chat area. See if anybody gets this. So as Cynthia mentioned, make sure that you're sending your messages to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your message. And if you don't know what a pitcher of water has to do with creating an accessible presentation, well then stay tuned because you're gonna find out. <laughs> Christine, that's great. Yes, absolutely. You don't wanna leave participants with a glass half full. All right. Great, well, thanks for that uh, comment. So we will move on, but just keep that in mind. So I will answer this question. What does a pitcher of water have to do with creating an accessible presentation? I also wanna give you a chance in the spirit of UDL to give you our universal design for learning. Um, I want you to, in the chat area, create a goal for yourself for this session. So what is it that you came to this presentation that you're hoping that to get out of it? So go ahead and type into the chat area. And this is also great because it helps me know that you can find the chat area. <laughs> so what is, what is that you want to get out of this presentation? And if you're feeling shy, sometimes people are a little shy. Um, you don't have to share it in the uh, chat area, but you can write it down for yourself on a post-it or on a piece of paper. be more thoughtful. I'm just gonna read out some of the comments that are coming through. At least one nugget to use in my next presentation. Uh, to be more thoughtful about my PowerPoint presentations. Want to know what I can change about my presentations to make them more accessible. You've come to the right place. To improve presentation quality and accessibility. Two or three strategies that I can easily incorporate into my work and share with educators in a way that's actionable. Lots of good stuff coming through. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the presentation and I will pause a few times and just give you a chance to reflect on those goals. All right, so the, the goal today is to really focus on accessibility. But what I found is that there is a very tight relationship between just creating a high quality presentation and accessibility sometimes. So what you do um, to develop your message, to create a presentation that's clear for everybody, sometimes improves the accessibility and vice versa. If you make it more accessible, it makes the presentation work for even more people. So in, in that spirit, um, I wanna share with you a little bit of my presentation journey and some of the resources that have shaped uh, that journey. Uh, so my first presentation was in fifth grade and I was uh, living in the Dominican Republic at the time, and I was going to Catholic school, and for a Mother's Day event, and Mother's Day was Sunday, so it kind of reminded me of this, um, I was asked to recite a poem in front of the entire school. Uh, of course, I didn't have PowerPoint at that point, <laughs> being in fifth grade in, in the Dominican Republic, but all of the elements of a presentation were there, right? I was out in front, in front of an audience and trying to deliver a message. And I don't know if it was because of the nuns or just the pressure of the moment, but towards the middle of the presentation, I kind of forgot my lines and kind of froze for a second. After a few, you know, a couple of minutes, I kind of recovered and I delivered those lines as best as I could. But from then on, that whole experience of being exposed and not in public really shaped the way that I presented. And public speaking and doing presentations 
kind of gave me a lot of anxiety. And I'm sure some of you have experienced this as well. Well, what uh, I've been doing for the last few years, at least the last three to four years, I've been doing presentations for a living, basically, uh, before joining the AIM Center. And so from a person that, you know, had a lot of anxiety around public speaking, over time I was able to improve and continue to get better and better to where I was able to do that for a living, basically. So what I'm trying to say is that if you work at it, you will get a lot better at creating presentations. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell says there's a 10,000 hour rule that basically it takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert in a field or a topic. I don't think it's quite that many, but the idea holds is that if you practice, the more you practice, the better you will get at the skill. So these are some of the books that I've used along the way. Probably the one that changed my life the most as a public speaker and presenter is Presentation Zen by Gar Reynolds. And I will probably refer to a few of his big ideas as we go through the presentation. Uh, more recently, uh, Resonate from Nancy Duarte um, really had a big impact on me. And she really emphasizes the importance of storytelling in your presentations. And uh, Nancy Duarte, in case you're not familiar, um, there was one presentation. This is a trivia question. What's the only presentation in history to win an Oscar? Let's see if any of you can put that into the chat area. Only presentation in history. And I'm kind of stretching the definition of presentation here. The only presentation in history, Christine, that won an Oscar. Any ideas? The last lecture, hmm. Thinking, thinking. Oh, see, I got you thinking now. All right, I will give you 25 seconds and I'm gonna give you the answer. Are you ready for it? Here it goes. An inconvenient truth. The only presentation to win an Oscar, and I'm stretching it a little bit because it really was the recording of the presentation that was then edited into a video. Uh, well, that presentation, was the team behind that presentation was Nancy Duarte's team. Uh, so if you want to learn more about her techniques that you know, led to winning an Oscar, you can read the book Resonate. And then Made to Stick uh, by the Heath brothers, it's not necessarily about presentations, but it's about crafting a good message. Um, one that's going to be sticky in the sense that people are going to go out and it's going to be actionable. Um, and so those three books have really changed my life when it comes to presentations. And I encourage you all uh, to pick them up. Um, you can, they're available in paperback, they're available as eBooks as well. All right, so moving on from some resources to help you craft better presentations, let's then shift gears here and talk about why accessibility. I think I hinted at that already, that you know there are people out there that have, um, significant challenges with vision, with hearing, and we need to address their needs during our presentations. But there's also something called the curb cut effect. And that really kind of captures the idea of universal design. Um, and the way that I like to put universal design is, is the idea that what is essential for some is almost always helpful for all. Uh, so here on the screen are some examples of uh, solutions that were developed with one group in mind, and then they benefit everybody else in society. Seatbelts were originally just for young children. Well, now they've saved, you know, thousands of lives over the years. Affirmative action originally was really meant to open the doors to higher education for uh, uh, African Americans. But, you know, women and other groups have benefited from those policies. Uh, bike lanes is one of the ones that I found the most interesting because it turns out you know, bike lanes are meant to benefit uh, bicyclists, but bike lanes also make the roads safer for everybody else, especially pedestrians, uh, probably because we're paying more attention when the bike lanes are there. Uh, and then obviously the best example is the curb cut, uh, where it originally designed for people in wheelchairs, but now uh, people who are pushing strollers, uh, UPS delivery people, I'm sure they love those curb cuts when they see them if they're pushing a big cart. So how about presentations? What are some examples that you can think of where that idea still holds? 
that which is uh, essential for some helps us all. So let's see, I'll give you a second in the chat, see if you can um, give us some suggestions there. If you think about a presentation, what are some great examples of universal design? And Luis, I'm just going to remind everybody because I know some people came in a little bit late that when you are entering um, your messages in the chat area, just above where you're entering text, you'll see uh, a two field uh, within blue. It, it indicates to whom you're sending, to whom, uh, who's seeing your, your text. So just make sure that that says all panelists and attendees. If it doesn't, click on that drop down arrow and choose all panelists and attendees so that everybody can uh, can see your messages. And that's really important because I really try to make this into a conversation and try to get us engaging with each other. So I see some options here, large font, use of images, use of closed captioning. Of, clo of course, that's a classic example, right? Closed captioning uh, benefits not only someone who has difficulty hearing, but also your speakers may stop working. Uh, not that I'm speaking from experience here or anything, uh, where you start a presentation with a video that you want to capture everybody's attention and then realize, oh, the audio is not working. Well, if you have the closed captions, everybody can still follow along and you don't lose some of your time. Uh, somebody mentioned large font. Well, great. That benefits somebody with low vision, but it also could be that you're in a large um, lecture hall. And so you, by presenting that information in larger font, simpler font and so on, it could benefit the person in the back of the room who shows up late. Or how about if you're presenting in an online platform where it's not necessarily that they see the entire slide at once. They may see the participants area, they may see the chat and so on, and the slides are actually pretty small or smaller than they normally would be when you're presenting live. And so there it makes, you know, it's a great benefit if you have simple slides with large text on them. Uh, if you make that text larger, you're probably not going to have a lot of space to put a lot of it. Um, so lots of great examples there. Thanks for sharing, everybody. Now, we also want to think about presentations from a UDL perspective. So not just accessibility, but keeping accessibility in mind in the context of neuroscience. I'm not going to go over the uh, principles of universal design for learning in detail. Um, if you know that the AIM Center is part of CAST, and CAS has tons of resources that explain universal design for learning in even more detail, including a recently updated UDL guidelines website. And uh, we have a link for that in the chat. It's udlguidelines.cas.org. But um, just in brief, the general idea behind universal design for learning is that we all vary. We all bring great variability to a presentation or to a meeting. And we vary in what engages us, we vary in how we take in information and make sense of it. And we also vary in how we're able to sort of uh, demonstrate our understanding, how we're able to navigate, how we're able to respond. Uh, so those are the three core principles of universal design for learning. They represent the why of learning, the what of learning, and the how of learning. For the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna focus primarily on the what and the how, right? Those two principles but I do want to touch on the engagement principle because that's a really important one. And that's really where it all starts is with capturing people's attention uh, and then making sure that you're delivering your message in a way that works uh, according to neuroscience. So for example, some of the things you can do, uh, we are wired for story. I don't know if you, some of you have heard this uh, expression. And so using stories uh, throughout your presentation is important. Uh, there's just an emotional connection that stories make um, that just makes the information a lot more memorable. Uh, and I shared a story with you already, right? I shared my story of my first presentation. So I want you to share one of your stories. What is your presenter's journey? Where did it start? Do you remember your first presentation? Or even better, can you share what's the weirdest thing that has happened to you during a presentation? So I'll give you a second to do that. And while you do that, I'll share mine uh, real quick. Um, towards the middle of a presentation, um, I am visually impaired and I have no peripheral vision, right? And so I needed to plug in my computer in the middle of a presentation. And as I bent down to plug in my computer, I caught the edge of the podium. 
right between the eyes. And it actually caused a really deep cut and there was blood everywhere. <laughs> well, after getting patched up, I proceeded to complete my presentation and then that presentation was part of a tour. So then I actually incorporated that into future presentations. I kind of wove that story into my presentation. Um, and, you know, it was a nice um, starting point for just creating some empathy between a presenter and the audience. So again, stories are, are really powerful. It's good to include them in your presentations. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, it was, well, it, it worked out in the end. So no, no worries. Christine says her computer popped up pictures of her daughters. <laughs> so that could be distracting, especially if you have somebody in the audience that has ADHD, right? And so all of a sudden they're just focusing on those photos rather than uh, the context or the content that you're trying to share. Lost the power in the middle of a presentation. That has happened to me as well. And so that kind of brings up the point of, you know, always having a plan B, right? So you could have uh, handouts or you could just, it's okay to ditch the slides and just have a conversation with the audience. Blackout seems to be common. So we're knocking on wood here that we don't have one of those in the middle of this presentation because of bad weather. All right, so here are some other ways. So stories are one way that you can tap into that engagement principle. Another one is embedding reflection or discussion throughout your presentation uh, so that you're emphasizing that connection, you're emphasizing the application of the new learning. Another way you can um, sort of break up the content is by using accessible media throughout. That could be a video, that could be a cartoon, just something that kind of tells the audience it's time to take a little bit of a mental break, a cognitive break, because our ability to hold information is kind of finite. And so if we go for an hour, just kind of doing the fire hose approach where we just throw information at people, at some point, you're gonna reach the limits of your you know, memory and your processing capabilities and you're kind of, kind of shut down. So it's good to sort of put in some breaks into your presentation uh, and you can do that using either reflection or using accessible media, or even just a music break, just so that you break things up and then you indicate that we're ready to move on to a new topic. So again, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on engagement um, in this presentation, but I can't emphasize enough that it is such an important principle uh, to address. All right, so here's what you came for, right? The best practices, the, the tips that will uh, get to the what and the how of how to make your presentations more accessible. Um, I do want to share this quote from Maya Angelou before we move on to the specific techniques, because uh, this is just as important as the techniques you're going to learn today. And uh, this is the mindset that I want you to have going forward is that when it comes to both presentations, so the quality of the presentations and accessibility, you should strive to do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, you do better. So this is a quote that was shared with me uh, by my colleague, Mindy Johnson. And there it is, she has it. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but Cynthia has Maya Angelou. Is, is that the book? I think it, so she has something uh, from Maya Angelou in her room. So again, great quote. Just a, just a card I received from a, from a friend. Oh, uh, awesome. Apropos. So again, I mean, I think this should apply to everything in life, but especially for our presentations. Do the best you can until you know better, and when you know better, do better. All right, so remember that question that I asked at the beginning. Um, that's where that pitcher of water comes in. Um, the pitcher, uh, here you see an image of um, the tip of a pitcher of water kind of pouring water into a wine glass. And the reason why I use that image is because um, that's an acronym that helps us keep in mind the principles, the big principles of accessibility. And the acronym is POUR, P-O-U-R. And this, these are the big principles that are sort of the, the scaffold, if you will, for the web content accessibility guidelines. So basically, when you are designing a presentation, when you're designing any kind of uh, message, the information, the interface, the navigation, they need to be perceivable, 
operable, understandable, and robust. And so that is our acronym for this afternoon, our graphic organizer, POUR. So I want you to pour in the accessibility into your presentations. And you're gonna see this graphic several times, just as a reminder. I hope it doesn't make you wanna to go to the bathroom or anything, but it's just there as a reminder. All right, so when we look at presentations, we need to consider that there are two parts to them. And uh, there's a slide deck, and then there's the handout. Now, um, a concept from Gar Reynolds' book, and I, I mentioned that I was going to refer to him a few times. Um, he says that we should avoid creating slideuments. <laughs> How many of you have created a slideuement in the past? I'm going to raise my hand because I know I've done that. So a slide demand basically is where you try to create both a slide deck and a handout in one product because you put in all the text into your slides. And so step one in Gard Reynolds' book uh, in his method is you take all that text and then you move it into the presenter's area. Um, and then you replace that text with some high quality images and some limited text, right? That basically captures the main idea that you're trying to convey. And then you create a handout where you share things like the links, you share some of the big ideas, you share the resources that you want people to have access to after the presentation. This is your value add. So after the presentation, they can make use of that information. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times what people do for the handout is they take the slides and then they print them out and then give you a copy of that. The problem is that without the presenter, a lot of times those handouts don't make any sense because you miss a lot of the information that the presenter has kind of interjected between the slides or in between the bullet points. So I want you to keep this in mind. Let's avoid slide demands and kind of think of them as separate items, the slide deck and the handout. And of course, with both, we need to make them accessible. There is an accessibility implication here uh, as well, because even if you make your presentation accessible, there is still kind of a challenge sometimes for screen reader users in navigating those slide decks in their presentation software. Whereas when you create that handout, you're probably gonna use something like Microsoft Word or a word processing application of some kind that is a little bit more linear uh, in its presentation format. And so that can be a little bit easier to navigate for screen reader users. So again, the handout is for after the presentation and it's also a way that you can provide the information in a linear format that can work a little bit better for assistive technologies such as screen readers. All right. So now let's get to pour in that accessibility. Uh, we're gonna begin with the first principle here, uh, perceivable. And the three things, I'm only gonna cover three things for each of these, but then I'm gonna share a resource with you where you can find more information. Uh, so uh, for perceivable, the key ideas are, we need to add alternative text for images and other visuals. We need to close caption the videos that we embed into our slides. And then we also need to make sure that the contrast between the text and its background is sufficient so that everybody can see it without undue effort. So let's begin with the first item here, adding alternative text to our images. Uh, here's some directions for how to do that. And I'll go through them uh, first in the slides and then I'm actually gonna do an example for you so you can see it in action. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm gonna start with PowerPoint. And what you'll do, once you add the image to your slide, you'll right click on it and you'll choose format picture or size and position. It really depends on which version of PowerPoint you're using. And then you're going to see um, a pane open up, the format picture pane. You wanna say, select layout and properties. And then you're gonna look for the description field. And that's where you're gonna add uh, your alternative text. So that's the text that's basically gonna be read out loud to somebody who's listening with a screen reader. So here's uh, the next step of that. You can see the format picture um, pane, and then I've selected the uh, layout and properties item or tab, which is the third one from the left. And then all the way at the bottom, I'm gonna find a description field. Now what's really confusing here 
and even we were confused a little earlier today when we were discussing this, is there's a title field as well. Uh, in practice, what I've done in the past, and I think it's a good approach, is to just focus on the description field and putting the text in there. Um, if you have a more complex image, you could provide some information in the title field, a shorter description, and then in the description field, you could put in a more extensive explanation of what the image is. The problem is in practice with my screen reader, it reads both of them one after the other. And so it's difficult to tell which one's the title, which one's the description. So over the years, what I've seen is most people just focus on the description field. And if you put it in there, you're going to be safe. Uh, the other thing I should mention is with Office 365, so that's the latest version of Office, Microsoft is actually now using uh, AI, artificial intelligence, to actually try to guess what the alternative text should be. Um, but as we know, alternative uh, um, artificial intelligence not always gets it accurately. So we wanna make sure that we go in there and we check to make sure that um, it's actually a valid description. So it, that's only possible if you have the latest version of Office 365, uh, where it will do that automatic alternative text description. Uh, but always for quality, um, make sure that you go in and you check that it's been uh, described correctly. All right, so here is a quick demo. We're gonna break things up here. I'm gonna exit out of my slides and right on the presentation that I'm delivering to you, we're gonna go through the steps here. So I am in PowerPoint for the Mac, obviously. That's what I use on a daily basis. Uh, but the steps are very similar. It's just the way things are called, maybe a little bit different. So in here, I'm gonna select my image and then I'm gonna right click or control click. If you don't, if you're on a computer that doesn't allow you to, uh, you don't have a mouse. And then I'm gonna choose format picture this may be uh, called something different if you're on Windows, but in this case, it'll be format picture. And then I'm gonna choose the third option here, layout or size and properties. And there we go. So you can see there's the title field, there's the description field. I'm gonna focus on the description field. That's the most reliable place to enter this description. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose that text that I put in that placeholder and then I'm going to put in the text. That's it. We are done. So again, the steps is select the image, right click, choose format picture, then choose the uh, third option here. I'm gonna hover over it size and properties, and then look for all text and then the description field. And you'll put in your description there. Are there any questions about that? Go ahead and uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and put those into the chat area. No questions so far, great. All right, so if you're in another presentation software, the, the steps in general are, uh, you know, pretty similar. It's just the name of the options on the screen, the interface is gonna change a little bit. So in Keynote, which I use quite a bit as a Mac user, you'll choose format in the toolbar, and then you'll choose the image tab, and towards the bottom of that pane, you will find a description field as well. And to answer your question, yes, it would be a good idea as you work on your presentation, make sure that you save. Uh, on a regular basis so that that way if you move away from that uh, text field and for some reason you know you, you remove it for whatever reason then it's um, you know it's not missing but uh, Luis you don't have to there's no save button right after you enter the the alt text there's no place which is can be a little disorienting you just have to trust that what you entered into that field is going to stay Absolutely, and just you can also leave that pane open and just keep going from image to image that you need to enter the alt text for, if that saves you a little bit of time. So Keynote has that option as well. It's just called something different. And then Google Slides. In Google Slides, you will right-click the image. You'll choose the alt text option. 
So it's a little bit clearer there. And then again, you'll enter your description into that field that appropriately is called description. So all of these software applications over the years have gotten this capability. Again, it's just, it's called something different or the path may be a little bit different, but you do have the option of adding the alternative text. And Diana just shared a great tip in there. So in Microsoft 365, you can add an icon for all text on the quick start menu bar. Also, I mentioned in Office 365 that it's now using um, artificial intelligence. You will actually see it on the screen at the bottom of the image. There's going to be a little field and it's going to show you the text for the alternative text. And you can right click on the image and say, edit all text if it's not the right text. So it does give you that option to edit them. I think that's a great addition. Now, in addition to making sure that the images have all text, we also want to make sure that it's good all text. <laughs> now, going into that discussion is beyond the amount of time we have today, but I do want to share a couple of options here, a couple of resources. Uh, WebAIM, it's a great website, and they have a page that focuses on alternative text. It has a number of examples that you can work through. So if you want to work on your alternative text uh, skills, this would be a great place to check out. And then for more complex images, the Diagram Center has some guidelines and Leslie has put in the both links into the chat area. So those are two resources that kind of go into different types of images and what kind of alternative text or uh, long description you need to use for those images. The second thing we would want to do in order to make the content more perceivable is we want to make sure that the videos that we embed have closed captions added to them. Uh, and uh, with PowerPoint 2016, uh, there's great support for captions built in. You can select the video, then go into the playback tab, and then you'll see an option for insert captions in there. Uh, what you're adding is actually the captions file. So this is a text file that has the text equivalent for what's being said in the video, along with the timing. And um, the format that PowerPoint needs, it's called Web VTT. And there are a number of applications that allow you to create those caption files. Um, I'm gonna share one with you that is definitely going to be in your budget because it's free. <laughs> and it's called Cadet, C-A-D-E-T. And it's a new captioning and description tool from the National Center on Accessible Media, or NCAM. Uh, so that is a tool that you can use. It's a standalone tool that you can use to create your caption file that you can then add to the video in PowerPoint. And then the uh, final thing um, that we'll address here is the need for sufficient contrast. So I want you to tell me, um, what does it say in the first box in this example, if you can see it? Some of you may be able to, right? But it does take a little bit of effort, doesn't it? And it, what it says is not enough contrast. <laughs> That's why it has an X next to it. Now compare that with the bottom example there, where we have uh, much better contrast. We're using black text on a yellow background. And so we have a check mark because that has you know, much better contrast and it takes a lot less effort uh, to read that text. So just as with the captioning, I just provided with you with a free tool. There are a couple here for checking your contrast. Uh, WebAIM is a web-based contrast checker. And then my favorite one and the one that I use day in, day out for everything from presentations to websites is the color contrast checker or a con color contrast analyzer from the Pacello group. And what I like about that one is that it's cross-platform, it's Windows and Mac, and it gives you a color picker. So you don't have to kind of, you know, find the color values or anything like that. You just use that color picker and you select the colors in your presentation or your website or your document. And then um, you select both colors, the background and the foreground, and then it tells you if it meets the contrast requirements for accessibility. So it's a very easy to use tool. It's free, cross-platform. Um, highly encourage you to check it out. And we have the link um, in the chat area for you to download that. All right, so let me pause here and see if there are any questions about perceivable or any tips. So if you have other tips, feel free to share those in the chat area as well. 
Uh, collectively, we know more than any of us knows individually. Luis, Christine had a question earlier that I don't think uh, got, got through to you. I think you were uh, moved on. The question, which I think this may be rhetorical, but <laughs> very, worth, very worth the discussion. Uh, what percentage of the presentations that you access have this completed? And I believe uh, Christine is referring to alt tags. And she says, I see it as straightforward but just need to get into the habit. That's, that's it, you, you got it there. It's just getting into the habit. It's not difficult. Um, and I think um, for a lot of people, they don't realize what a huge benefit it is uh, for you know, people who are blind. And you don't have to be blind, you could be like me. I have low vision and if I'm watching, you send me some slides and I need to review them, well, towards the end of the day, my eyes get tired. So even though I have some vision remaining, I may just turn on the text-to-speech just to give my eyes a rest. Or it could be that I multitask and I want to review something and while I'm doing something else, well, I can you know, listen to it as well using text-to-speech. So there are many options, many reasons why we would want to do this. Um, but again, I think it's just more of like having the mindset of wanting to do it and then kind of getting into the habit of it. Because the more you do it, the easier it gets. Remember that quote from Maya Angelou. <laughs> Are there any other questions that I may have missed? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, Cynthia said, and this is, I think there are two, there may be another Cynthia Curry in the um, attendees. I was kind of thrown by that. I didn't think I was logged in twice. That's um, Joy, probably. <laughs> oh, that is Joy. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, Joy Zabal is, we're having an issue with uh, identity in Zoom. Um, <laughs> she just made the, the comment that retrofitting inaccessible slides can lead to some weird error messages from the accessibility checker. Well, and, and it's always better to kind of do this at the, as you go through and design your presentations rather than at the end, because as Cynthia can tell you, if it's the night before, uh, and I can tell you this too, and you have all of a sudden a presentation with 50 slides, and you have to go through and do this for all those 50 slides, it becomes more of a lift. So if you do it as you go along, um, it becomes a little bit easier. All right, so I'm looking at time here, so I'm going to move on just to make sure we have enough time to cover the three remaining principles. So if P is for perceivable, O is for operable. And there's a few things here that we can do um, to make our slides work better. Uh, we can provide unique slide titles, we can use descriptive link text, and then we can check the reading order. So let's go ahead and take a look at those three items. So providing unique slide titles. In Microsoft PowerPoint, you can go in and look at an outline of your content. And you do that by choosing view and then outline view. Uh, this is important uh, because it benefits um, screen reader users. Uh, they can go through that outline and it's, you know, as they navigate through the outline, when they get to the uh, title for the slide that they want to explore in more detail, then they can choose that slide. So especially if you have a very long presentation, this is a really nice navigation aid that you can provide. But it, it could also be beneficial for other people, uh, people with learning disabilities or cognitive challenges. Uh, they may want to open that outline and see how the content is organized and it can serve as a good graphic organizer for them. And you can see an example there um, of that outline view. Uh, so the slide titles are going to be in bold, and then right underneath that, you're going to see the content, and that's not in bold. The other thing we, we can do um, is we can make sure that our link text is descriptive, uh, because um, that will help our screen reader users again. So here's an example for you. Screen reader users may access links out of context on a list. Which of these two links takes you to the CAS homepage? Now, this is, you know, this is a very simplified example. You have a 50-50 chance here, right? But it could be a lot longer. Um, it, there could be many more items on the screen. And so I like to call this uh, mystery meet navigation. So basically, you don't know what's at the other end of each of these links. It's mystery meet. 
Uh, so here's an example of how we can make that better. How about if we do this instead? Let's try that again. And in this case, we've selected some text that's descriptive and we've made that the link. So now there is no guessing, there is no mystery meet. Um, you know exactly when you click on this link where it's gonna take you. One of them takes you to the CAST website, the other one takes you to the AIM Center. And the reason why this is really important is I may access this on my screen reader just by pressing a keyboard shortcut that shows me all of the links. And so you can't count on the surrounding text uh, to provide that context. Here's another challenge that I see with um, links in presentations where people put in the entire URL. And for this example, we actually have a demo. So this is a link to the handout for this presentation. So let's listen to it with a uh, screen reader. I'm just gonna click play here and hopefully it will come through for you. Oh, sorry, clicked in the wrong place. Let's try that again. HTTPS colon slash slash docs dot google dot com slash document slash d slash one still h two five w underscore plsqr and sei five seven rpl. Everybody got that? <laughs> know what that link's referring to? <laughs> Probably not. So the problem there is most screen readers, once they get past the main part of the URL, you know, the docs dot google dot com then they're gonna read everything one character at a time. And that could be numbers, it could be letters, it could be special symbols like question mark. So again, the, the best practice here is to select some descriptive text and make that the link instead. And that will help you not just with your presentation, but it also help you with your handouts. So that's a great practice for both. And then um, the reading order. So this one is a little bit tricky and uh, I put in a note here because this is really important to keep in mind. Um, once you go into the home tab, you're gonna find an arrange option and that will let you open the selection pane. And there you can see the reading order. But here's the trick. The reading order is the inverse of what you would expect. It doesn't read it from top to bottom. It actually reads it from the bottom first. So you can think of it as different layers. And so the first layer, the one at the bottom, that's the first one that it will read. And then it will progress from there. Guess what? I have a demo. So I'm gonna show you in this presentation how I can do that. So I'm gonna go back to the previous slide on reading order. And I'm gonna choose the home tab. In the home tab, I'm gonna choose arrange and then the selection pane. And here you can see the items in my slide. I'm just gonna click on them and as I do that, you will see a border around the item that's selected. So here is one of the ways that I prefer my reading order. The first thing that I want to have read is the number of the slide so that I know I'm in the right place. The next thing is the title. Again, that's a uh, location support, it lets me know I'm on the right slide, the one that I intended to uh, read. Then I'll have the main content, I'll have the image, and then finally this hashtag at the bottom there that is not as important. So I have that read out loud last. So again, the first thing that gets read by the screen reader is the one at the bottom, not the one at the top. The other thing you can do here is if for aesthetic reasons you wanna have a title on your slide, but you don't want it to show, you can click the little eye icon and that turns it off, it turns off its visibility. So it's still on the slide and it can still be read out by a screen reader, it's just not visible. Okay, so it's that little eye icon there. You can see I'm removing that from the uh, visual display but if I go to the outline for this presentation, you will still see a slide title on there. So I can't emphasize enough, having clear uh, descriptive slide titles is really important for um, orienting people if they're using a screen reader. All right, so let me go back over here and go back into my presentation. Are there any questions about those techniques for making your presentation more operable? Let's see what people have to say. Luis, there was, um, well, Cynthia Curry 
I happen to make a comment, but we know that's Joy Zabala. Uh, <laughs> she says, if someone prints the slides, is there a way for them to see the URLs? So this is, a, this is in relation to making sure that you have descriptive URLs uh, within your slides. I will generally, what my practice has been, I put it um, in the handout. Um, and then I'll put them at the end of the handout as a list. Um, so within the main part of the handout, I'll use descriptive hyperlinks. And then maybe on the last page, I'll put in, you know, the names of the resources and then what the actual links are if people want to print it out. Um, again, it's that idea that the slideshow is for a specific purpose for presenting and the handout is what people will be able to use afterwards. Does that make sense, Joy? All right, she's giving me the thumbs up. She says, good idea. <laughs> Let's see, there's another comment from Christine, uh, from Maine. Oh yes, um, that kind of brings up to mind. You don't need to say image of because the screen reader already does that. You just need to provide the description. So that's just a general good accessibility practice. All right, so I'm gonna move through the last two concepts here, understandable and robust. Uh, so for understandable, uh, just basically keeping things consistent, uh, focusing on simplicity, always a good idea because that benefits people that have cognitive or learning challenges. So in this presentation that you're looking at, I've only used two different types of slides. One to introduce each big section, and then the other one for the individual points that I wanna make. So that keeps things simple, but also it gives you a consistent uh, layout that you can focus on. And then this is, doesn't have so much to do with the actual presentation, but when you deliver it, and it has to do with using descriptive language. Uh, and in your handout, there is a link to this great article, This, That, and There, uh, from 2013. And it's that idea that a lot of times in meetings and in presentations, we'll say, over here. <laughs> well, if you're not looking, or even if you're, um, or if you're remote, if you're calling in, right, you may be calling in, that doesn't mean anything to you. Right, over here doesn't mean anything, or it's this big, right? I'm holding my hands here below me, it's this big. You can't see that if you're calling in or if you're not looking at the presenter at that moment. So it's important to use descriptive language. So here's some examples. New Zealand is here while pointing on a map. Well, instead we could say New Zealand is in the South you know, Pacific, right next to Australia, to the right of it or something like that. So you get the idea, right? Just be more descriptive. And then the last concept is that of robust. And here, Microsoft PowerPoint really helps us out because it has an accessibility checker. It's really easy to use. Basically, um, I'm gonna show it to you real quick. We're gonna run it on this same presentation that I'm on right now. So what you'll do is, while you're on your presentation, you'll go to the Review tab, and there's a button called Check for Accessibility. I'll go ahead and run that and it gives me a rundown of some of the errors that I found. Now, in this presentation, you're gonna find some errors because I put them there on purpose <laughs> for illustration purposes. But um, there are some things that you will have to check manually because the PowerPoint accessibility checker can't do that for you. So for instance, the contrast is something that you will often have to check yourself. Or the reading order, that's another one that often will come up and that you may have to check. Uh, for yourself. But this is a great starting point. It's a great way of getting a general sense of how accessible your presentation is. Uh, the one that you'll often get is missing slide title. So again, I did that on purpose on one slide or missing alternative text. Uh, it won't tell you whether that alternative text is good or not, but at least it's a good start to know which images are missing it. And as you click around, it will actually take you to the slide where that problem is found. So it can save you quite a bit of time. Uh, how many of you have used the accessibility checker? What's been your experience? Go ahead and share that in the chat area. While I find my place here.
Yep, Cynthia says reading order. <laughs> that uh, our checkers are just not that good at that yet. We need some human interaction to do that. Ah, Joy. So Joy is talking about engagement here for herself. She says she gets a thrill when there are no errors. You feel mighty. I do too. <laughs> it really makes you feel good uh, when you get one that doesn't show, you know, page after page that you have to scroll. <laughs> that is always a good thing. All right, so just to wrap up here. So again, poor, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Those are the big principles. And once you kind of focus on those big principles, then you can then move on to the individual techniques. Um, but it's really the mindset of wanting to make the presentations more accessible and then having those big principles in mind that's important. So just remember, the handout has to be accessible as well. So a lot of these techniques, yes. This is your requested five minute warning. <laughs> as requested, thanks. You got it, there's only one more slide or two. So again, the same things that you do in your presentation, make sure that you're following the same ideas in your uh, handout. You need to have descriptive links, you need to make sure things are, um, the images are accessible. Um, so it, it, the same thing applies to your handout. So where can you learn more? Oh, I know just the place, the AIM Center. We have a resource called Designing for Accessibility with Poor. And um, it starts with a nice video. And then for each of the principles, we break it down into the specific techniques and you'll learn the why, the how, the what, all of that is included in there. So I encourage you to check that out um, on our website. That's it for me, because Leslie said so. And um, here's my contact information. Uh, my email is lperez at cast.org. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at IonAxis, E-Y-E-O-N-A-X-S. We also would love for you to take a survey. Uh, this helps us improve our presentations, make them better for the future, um, or just kind of get an idea of you know, what we can do uh, to meet your needs. So please take a moment to complete our uh, webinar evaluation. Um, that's going to be shared in the chat area, I believe. So yes. Should... Yeah, Leslie, just drop the link to the survey. Yep. And so are there any last minute questions or thoughts? Um, I want you to go back and just take a second. Um, you said you came in here. Actually, you didn't say it. I asked you. I asked you to set a goal for today. So I want you to think, was that goal met? And if not, then what is one outstanding question that you have in the, the few minutes that we have remaining? Oh, and Luis, we just want to reserve a couple of minutes for Christine as well. So as uh, these questions, as, these, as the comments are coming in, perhaps we can um, give, we can uh, give Christine, Christine. The, Christine the mic. Go ahead, Christine, you're currently muted. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I want to say thank you um, to both Cynthia and Luis. And I know for myself, um, not only have I learned things that I should be doing, but also things that I can share. Some see the staff is on today, some are not. We also work with multiple consultants um, that will start using more best practices in our CETA world, and hopefully that will um, support everyone. Uh, and then I just have a few quick uh, membership updates, so if people can hang on for a couple extra minutes we would appreciate that. Um, and I, again, our AIM Center uh, partnership, I think is invaluable. And I'm so glad that you're able to archive these and have the transcript and we will definitely push them out. And we would encourage our members to share them amongst your colleagues in your state departments and even to your LEAs as well. Um, and then I'm guessing that Cynthia and Luis would love feedback. So not only your feedback of you enjoyed the presentation today, but if you are able to share it in your states, that would be helpful to their cause to be able to learn how you've been able to leverage these resources that they've supported us with. Uh, so just really quickly, um, yeah, and the survey um, is, is helpful to them. Um, just really quickly, some membership updates. We hope that you have seen, um, there is a big buzz on Capitol Hill around net neutrality. Um, and on Thursday, um, it will be brought up into the Senate to reverse um, the 
the changes in net neutrality that came about with the new administration. So um, please note that CETA is partnering with ISTE, COSIN, and other organizations to make that push forward um, because we feel that it will benefit, especially those um, rural and small um, schools and districts. In addition, um, we're continuing to advocate for Title IV-A um, and the funding within that program and being able to support the state um, as leaders in that program so the funding is used most efficiently and effectively and hopefully they're leveraging the digital learning option. Um, there has been quite a bit of um, in the news about the U.S. Department of Education and some reorganization. We have a call later this week with the Office of Ed Tech to try to get some insight there. If you're following that on social media, um, it probably is a good idea if you haven't seen anything as of yet. Um, we're, we're really not sure thing, where things will land, but we just wanted to make you aware that we're, um, we understand the situation and we're trying to investigate and we will share as much as we can um, as soon as we are able to do so. And I think there are a lot of, of unknowns in that. Uh, then with the Emerging um, Technologies Leadership Forum, I'm happy to say that both Cynthia and Luis will be there in person. They are going to be providing um, some accessibility uh, sessions for our emerging cohort of our emerging partners, as well as our annual private sector partners. And um, there was a couple of them on the call today, but I think that this is, would be a great opportunity for you all to meet them in person um, and connect uh, as they'll be at the reception and some other of the, the meals, et cetera. So, um, and then can also participate in our unconference sessions at the end of the day. So hopefully you'll get to meet them in person. In addition, I'm excited to share that we have 48 states, three territories and the District of Columbia participating this year. It is the largest, um, turnout we've ever had for our June event with almost um, over 95 attendees. So um, if you have friends in South Carolina or Rhode Island, I'm on a mission to get all 50 states. And uh, we are working with some of the folks we know and trying to make new friends there so that we can say that all 50 states attended our event. Uh, hopefully, and I'll type this in here, hopefully you are saving the date November 4th through the 7th for the Leadership at Arjun event. And um, we hope to, again, uh, last October was our largest leadership summit as far as participation, and we're hoping to see that this year. So put it on your calendar, invite a guest. Uh, thank you to Stan for your support. And then um, strategic initiatives. Um, CETA has been a very busy place over the last few months. We launched yesterday the interoperability paper um, and that has gotten um, some traction on social media and Tracy's participated in several interviews. So please be sure to check that out. Um, we are excited that we're able to continue a partnership with EdFi and the Dell Foundation at our June event to provide technical assistance and professional development for instructional leaders on interoperability. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago, we launched the Transformative Digital Learning, um, a guide to implementation. That's a revamp of the digitallearning.ceta.org website. So please check that out. And on May 30th, we are hosting a webinar on EdWeb, uh, Navigating the Digital Shift 2018. So that'll be our third iteration of that paper. And again, in partnership, um, Cynthia and Luis are taking a look at that draft and helping to ensure the accessibility content in there um, is thorough and uh, that we can link out to as many resources as possible. We're happy too that so many of the AIM contacts in your state supported the process on DMAP. So we have access to the accessibility policies um, and we look forward to that continued partnership. So I rattled off a lot of updates and information. Please feel free to post a question and then I think Missy's on. If anyone else from the staff, Tracy had a conflict, um, please feel free to speak up. Okay, um, and I also would share, um, just because we're talking about accessibility today, you're right, the transformational guide also has um, references to accessibility, and I'll just give a plug to Cynthia and Louise, we're always coming up with new ideas, so we probably can look at that and see what else we can add and, and share. So that's it from the CETA side. 
All right. Well, thank you, Cita Side. <laughs> it's always good to have a name side and a Cita Side. I think we look, work uh, really well together. So thank you, Christine, for, um, you know, obviously with all the all the activities you mentioned, uh, you know, AIM Center Accessibility really has been embedded in, um, in CETA's work and this goes back um, several years, I, I know. So it's great to have these webinars to continue to promote it. And uh, Luis and I and some of the AIM Best Practices leaders from other states will also be at the Leadership Summit in November as well. So really looking forward to, um, to participating in that event as well. Luis, I'm gonna give you the final words other than asking everybody to please, if you're still here, thanks for hanging on and please uh, complete the survey for us so that we, part of that is like, you know, we're gonna be continuing our, our partnership with CETA. So what else can the AIM Center do to support you? If you can get specific, that will uh, help us make sure that we are meeting your needs and uh, learn from you as well. So thanks so much for the opportunity. No final thoughts. Just thank you very much, everybody, for hanging in there. And uh, again, you can get in touch with me as uh, at the AIM Center, uh, and I'll be happy to provide technical assistance in any way that I can. So thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Donna, for the captioning, and uh, Leslie for um, for helping us out in the chat. Your technical assistance. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Till next time. <laughs>